is the introductory print to the exhibition called Powhatan Gunboat Diplomacy. And Powhatan is the name of Commodore Perry's flagship in the squadron that uh, forced entry into Japan and China, 1858, I believe. It, it interested me that the word Powhatan has appeared throughout American history here and there, not only as the name of Perry's flagship, but also prior to that, the name of the, the native peoples and the chief Powhatan in uh, the colonial period. I had been looking at Japanese prints a great deal, particularly the Yokohama A prints that show the five peoples of the five nations from a Japanese perspective. And one of the things that is consistent in Yokohama A is a, is a fascination with Western technology. For instance, hot air ballooning and uh, photography. And there was a very deliberate attempt on the part of the Five Nations to impress the Japanese with examples of their technological marvels. Here's a small scale steam locomotive that was installed in, it might have been Nagasaki, I'm not sure where this occurred, uh, as a way of uh, ameliorating their entry. And um, it became a very diplomatic maneuver. And I had read that the British in Burma used grand pianos to impress the uh, Burmese royalty. And that, that's been called by authors uh, piano diplomacy. I call this print Powhatan Gunboat Diplomacy. The print is a triptych. Roughly, it, it starts with the earliest stages of the contact of the cultural intersection. And that's represented by the beaver skin top hat of the time, let's say roughly 1859, 1860. It's also very important that these, these artifacts uh, are true to the period that I'm depicting. So um, I spend a lot of effort in locating artifacts to use that are historically accurate. This is not of the 1860s, but I couldn't resist using it because this hat is labeled, and it was probably a, a souvenir from a World's Fair, perhaps the 1904 St. Louis Exposition, perhaps the 1893 Columbian Exposition, but it's a commercially made product, and it's labeled Yellow Race. So these two pieces of headwear form the basis of the first part of the triptych with pieces of pottery and glass that were found immediately across the street. There's a ravine near the house that was a 19th century garbage dump. And Cora and Shea, my daughters, would play in the ravine and often come home with 19th century artifacts. And I took a number of these artifacts that were found very nearby and constructed a, an abstract representation of, to me, a human face or head to signify this first meeting of the two peoples. The center panel is the part that most literally addresses the diplomacy part, the negotiation 
through cultural activity, through technology, you'll see schematic renderings of a, a fan. Now that particular technology of the folding fan is actually Japanese on thread and not Chinese, but it's, it's appropriate to the print since we are talking about Japan and China. And I took a 19th century gas compressed, compressed air tank for a stove that I found at a, a local flea market. And I used it as the body of this imagined aerial device in direct reference to images such as what I showed you earlier, this, this Yokohama A print of a balloon ascension that took place in Washington, D.C. I believe that happened in 1862 or three. So there, there was a very direct influence of an existing piece of artwork in the making of the center panel that follows the initial contact in part one. It was lucky that I found the uh, compression tank. I had been looking for a way of representing an aerial device and came upon this inflated form. And that, that really clicked. I, and I knew that I had it. The rest just fell into place very, very easily. I already had a small plastic rowboat that uh, would serve for the, the diagram of the boat down below. Everything fell into place quite readily once this key object had been located. The third part, I had known in advance that it would result in uh, the representation of the act of historical uh, writing, uh, the official account or the, the master narrative. It was, it was a matter of deciding how to accomplish that. Consistent with the technological device idea of the center panel, I extended that idea by using calipers. And I, I did know that calipers were used in this method of uh, scientific analysis that was uh, racially biased. Craniums were measured by calipers to determine uh, intelligence and you know, degrees of cultural development and such. So it, I looked for and found calipers, got it online, and uh, had already been using quill pens with the children. We would go out and find feathers and fashion them into writing instruments, and Cora in particular would do calligraphy. And this is the actual feather that was used in this print, and you'll see traces of ink on here from earlier use. And again, it's important, it's important to know that this isn't just a prop. This was actually used as a drawing and writing instrument. And here are the calipers. Would be some abstracted hand clutching the pen and writing the uh, official accounts of these interactions. And so, roughly speaking, this, this print terminates in a panel that calls attention to the, the question of who, who has the right to create these historical accounts. And the print in the show immediately adjacent to it is very different in concept from this triptych concerning uh, colonial forays in various parts of the world. It's a story that is uh, solely Chinese. And uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, very, quite early, dating, I think, to the Tang Dynasty. Now, I was at a museum and was reading the wall text to a carved figure with uh, a substantial base. And the wall text described that when 
curators discovered that the base was hollow, they went further and found a portal, a doorway to the base, opened it up, reached in, and found a handwritten account of a paintbrush to which was tied multiple strings or threads, each one held by a member of the community. And that was such a wonderful idea. Now this print does uh, follow the making of this print by, I think, several years, three years perhaps. And it wasn't until Jack and I started to collaborate in greater detail about this exhibition that the opportunity arose to place another print in relation to Powhatan uh, gunboat diplomacy. I chose five hands for some inexplicable reason. And it suddenly struck me that both prints contain representations of writing instruments or drawing instruments. That was a happy coincidence. Also happily, it's a print that addresses an idea that is so much more about shared experience and uh, multiple authorship is more broadly about community activity with great significance. And I think it's a beautiful pairing in both conceptually and formally. The, I do have the brushes that, the brush that uh, was the basis of this. It, it is a brush that was brought to the United States by my father. When he left China, he purchased a number of what we call scholar's equipment, a, a number of pieces of scholar's equipment, including textbooks on calligraphy and uh, a large array of calligraphy brushes such as these. These were brought over by my father. I don't think he ever really used them, but it, he was attached to the idea of taking possession of them and transporting them to Chicago. It's interesting to me that my father felt the need to retain possession of these, this category of cultural goods when he knew that he was leaving China permanently. And uh, I was happy to be able to use a brush that had been valued so much by my father. Now that I think of it, this brush is a digital composite. I think I photoshopped the head of this brush onto this handle, which is this brush, because I wanted the calligraphy to be part of the visual representation. I didn't have a brush that was as um, voluminous as this. So, and it's rare that I do it, so I photoshopped the, uh, that relic. I recall having a lot of, uh, not trouble, but I deliberated for a long period of time about the, the nature of the mark and the configuration that is aside from the schematic line, the calligraphic mark that's slightly textured is uh, something that I gave a lot of thought to. I looked at a lot of Bryce Martin work. He did, he, he continues to do paintings and prints that are calligraphic. In fact, there's a uh, series of his paintings called uh, Chinese Paintings. And I examined the systematic way that he would use triangulation in some of his major works and I adapted some of those systems to this configuration that 
also, I think, has a slight resemblance to a bird. I, as soon as I say that, I'm a little regretful because once you call attention to something, to what it adheres to, you can't free yourself from that association. But I've said it, it's, it's, it's a kind of a bird. I think it's important that I had already had this experience in the making of this triptych when I found that narrative in a museum. And I'm sorry I can't be more precise about which museum I learned this in. It might have been likely it was the Nelson Atkins, but it might, might have also been the Freer. And I'm going to find out. Um, when I read that text and when I looked at that um, religious statue, I, it was so striking because it was so strikingly antithetical or unlike the, the use of a writing instrument that I had already examined through the making of uh, Powhatan. And it was the contrast to the ideologies, the concepts that uh, made me want to make this print. It is such a great idea that uh, you just, I just felt like I had to uh, visualize it. And in, in a sense, in the making of the, the print, the making of the art, based on an idea that I think is so important, I'm, I'm in a sense valorizing, or not just calling attention to the idea that uh, these, this ethic, this you know, social, political, cultural ethic uh, had existed long ago in China. And the coincidence of that differentiation concerning China in both, and also to some extent Japan in this print, was another marvelous coincidence that I realized when in the organization of this show they came together. There's not much more that I can say about the, the use of those writing instruments. One is very restrictive and one is very liberating. There's a constraint and there's a release. But in looking at the relationship between the triptych and the single panel, I, I'm still somewhat struck, having done them some time ago and gone through the whole process of those uh, realizations that were quite forceful. They still, those, the significance of that difference is still resonant when I look at them. But that's also partly formal, right? I mean, look at, look at the way this is just almost kind of plotting in its linearity. It's, it's, it's a very antiquated idea of, let's say, literature. The arc of the story from beginning to end is an empathy with characters. It's, it's, it's not postmodern. <laughs> not, not. This is something else, and yet it's a narrative that comes out of something that happened as long ago as the Tang Dynasty. And it is so postmodern. It still strikes me when I look at it. And, and I hope that's reflected in the way that the, the work is formalized. You know, this jumble of information. How there's a seeming convolution in this, but but not. It's a very productive kind of ambiguity very contrasted to the rationally laid out endeavor here. And it's true, it, it, I get into the mindset of the imagined characters that are the players in something like this. I think it was entirely appropriate to make this in three parts that cohere, but are yet still separable in stages with this very Western, antique procedure of uh, a starting point and a finality.
and then what's suggested through the, the last panel is in, in terms of, in terms of uh, continuum. But it's a continuum that's still suggested to be linear. Very unlike this. I really do like this combination. It, it, and again, it was something that happened in the uh, collaboration between Jack and myself. This is the wonderful thing about doing exhibitions like this. It's, I said to Jack yesterday, it, it, I concede readily that artists have so much to gain through a, a relationship with others, through professionals who are uh, curators and uh, historians and philosophers and musicians. And I often seek people outside of the art world to have discussion with, to, to bounce ideas off of when it was time to choose an essayist for the catalog in China for the show in Beijing. I chose a musical composer that lives in Brooklyn. And one of the best books I've read about romantic, romanticism or romanticist painting was written by musical composers, Rosen. Fresh air. And this is this is the one print that has to do with classical concepts that came from like suddenly out of nowhere. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't cogitated to a point of finality in the making of something. It was just like it was like an idea that was handed to me. So when you when you when you you know you say, well, what are some of the prints that that pertain to traditional Chinese thinking? This one really is prominent to me because of how I discovered the narrative and how impressive it was. And so for that reason alone, because we had that north wall to occupy, because we, we took away, provisionally we took away the idea of objects, creating more space for another artwork, it was this one. And then only, only secondarily mocking it up that I look at it and say, wow, look, it's." It's a brush and a quill pen. Really, I mean, it sounds incredible that I didn't foresee that happenstance, but yeah, I really didn't. But that, that's part of my enjoyment about the pairing. I think divergent thinking. I think um, opening possibilities. I think trying to, uh, in an opening pair of works, hopefully with some help in text and this video, the immediate appreciation, comprehension and appreciation of the range of qualities of thinking and approaches to a relationship with uh, emotions and concepts and materials and, and, and uh, um, a relationship to uh, physical world. It's just, I think, the divergence of thinking is, is what immediately comes to mind, Jack, when you, you ask that particular question. It establishes a range because this one is, is just as restrictive in the end. It, it, it's not a happy story. It, it, it could be, and in some instances it has been, but those are wonderful exceptions. When I read the Spence book, To Change China, and I read that chapter on, is it Jeremy Bethan? I mean, he's just the most extraordinary person. He was an exception to these occurrences, to these constraints, to this domination, you know. I mean, they needed to exist for there to be a bathroom, you know, but, but, but the kind of the marvelousness of that character, of that, uh, and what he actually lived, I mean, he really walked the walk, you know, and paid for it with his life.
so you've got the uh, you've got Commodore Perry on one hand, and then and then some years later you've got the outcome that could be represented a possible outcome that's represented by somebody like Bethim, you know. But in and of itself, this print is is kind of constraining. It's it's not that happy. It's it's. It's historical fact. In my book, it's historical fact. What I would like to know is, did this actually occur? That's something that that wall text didn't say. Could there have actually been a community, a community-based experience where this was enacted? Because it's physically possible. And I, I thought of, as a, an art professor, you know, s setting this up in a drawing class, where, we, where I create a drawing instrument and I tie 10 tethers to it and give the assignment of everybody going at it. You know, that would be wonderful to do. I wonder if that actually occurred or not in many calligraphic marks and trying to decide what configuration should be drawn up there. And um, I held the brush correctly. I ground my ink to pure saturation. Um, I, I did recall some of the proper ways, probably not entirely, but I did recall largely the right way to do it. And I did use ink cakes that my mother gave me and I used a stone that she gave me from uh, China when they came. That, that, that was uh, some of the paraphernalia that my father brought. And I made sure to use um, those things, not things that I bought in Chinatown, for instance, or in, in Beijing. It was uh, family related. And yeah, I think you can see even in this representation or facsimile of the line, the kinds of uh, fullness of ink where it impacts the paper and where the varying nuance of pressure results in a trailing mark or a, uh, a widening mark. And it's, I think I captured what the calligraphic brush is capable of doing. I think it's very important that you get a transition from this impact to that near disappearance. I, I was very, <laughs> in fact, if you want to know about um, simulation, when I drew that line and liked it, there was a total break in that mark. And um, I, I took a rapidograph pen, a totally Western uh, device, and connected it <laughs> to, uh, to draw or simulate the thinness or fineness that the calligraphic brush is sometimes capable of producing when you're down to two hairs. <laughs> but I did it with a rapidograph. I did it with a triple O India ink rapidograph pen. And I was aware of the, the irony of that, you know, you have to fight funny simulation. True and false. I didn't go, I, I showed enough of an interest so that I, I was the only one of my siblings that did it. Uh, I was always the one that wanted to know about that culture and, and try it out. But it wasn't more than trying it out, Jack. You know, it was like, I wasn't disciplined and I wasn't a master at it by any means. But I, I still remember some of the things. <laughs> she taught me how to uh, bind books with uh, needle and thread, and uh, I continue to do that. I, I, I teach students how to do that. It comes directly from my mother. I taught the girls how to do it. Yeah. So it is cursory knowledge, but it's applicable and uh, important. Yeah. It's a two flat that my brother and sister and I still retain possession of. And nothing has changed in that dwelling since they died. It, it's eerie. I, I don't really like to sleep there. It's too confining emotionally. It 
wasn't that long ago that I donated my father's winter coat and, sh and boots to Goodwill after he, he came home and hung up his, his coat and took off his shoes and went to bed and had a stroke. And my brother and sister and I, we lived with those last effects just as they were left for years. Finally, I couldn't tolerate it anymore. And I just kind of swallowed hard and put it in a bag and drove it off. You know, it's like that everywhere, everywhere. You know, my mother's hair is on her comb. To do notes on her dresser top. It's, you know, it's. You know. I never. It's here again. You know, just this is a concrete example of a print that I thought was about traditional Chinese concepts of antiquity. And here we are talking about my mom and the dining room and the house. You know? And really, this is the first time that I've thought of this in the context of my family. I hadn't remembered that it was my mother that taught me how to do this or grinding, really. And so when I said earlier that these categories are permeable and they bleed, this will lead to the next set of prints that has to do with my father immediately. And I, I hadn't seen it that way previously. It really is all, you know, what would you call it? This, this cloud of interminglings is more extensive than ongoing than I, I realized. Because I do think in terms of subjects when I make these things, right? I, I, I always start with some intentionality. I like the idea that if you can think it, you can draw. So a lot of my ideas come from reading, from what I overhear, from seeing, watching movies, from discussion. And, it, and, I, and I, I try to test the limits of this premise that if I can think it, I can draw it effectively and communicate it. Not just to draw, but communicate it to the extent that maybe with some assistance, such as what we're going to do for the show, like this, this production, uh, people will be able to participate. I want people to be able to participate. I don't like the added, I don't like what they threw at me in undergraduate school in Chicago. Your, your role as an artist is to be a taste maker and screw them if your audience can't get it. Smoke them. Just smoke them. You're in the lead, you're the tastemaker. And you know, he said that to us in the 70s. Even then, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't right. It struck me as not being a good thing to do. I was, I was always interested in people being able to participate in the imagery that I made. And I think that's why, in the largest overview, when you look back at my work, I could fairly be called a realist. I was always interested in representations through art process of the world as it appears. Some, a rather high degree of adherence to the material world as it appears. And I'm, I'm still doing that. The, the process has become more layered and uh, exploded. And there are rational perspective, linear perspective has been eliminated. But I think they can still be recognized as having a relationship to realist. And by realist, I'm using them deliberately. Well, I shouldn't do this. I, I say to my students all the time, realism is not a style. It's not a form of style. It's not a particular set of tools that you enact, that you put into a play. It, it's, it's content. Realism is content. But in this sense, I'm using the kind of often misunderstood use of the word realism. I'm using it as an adherence to the world as it appears. You can still see that here. I draw from life. I photograph things. The close examination of physical things is something I've done consistently since I was a child.
even though these works are more abstract. And again, abstraction is not a style, it's a specific separation or distancing from any instance or thing. And in that sense, they're more abstract. But this series of work directly comes from a long history of painting, drawing, and making other prints in other media that could be fairly called realist. I think it would be worth showing you, for instance, you know, these are, these are hand-drawn lithographs. And these structures don't actually exist. I, they're imagined, and then I reify them through a process of model making, and I draw again from the model, and then I commit that schematic drawing to a fleshed out drawing on a lithographic stone, process the stone, and print it on this art paper. So these were uh, graduate school, immediate postgraduate work. There is a relationship, I think, in terms of this discussion of the world as it appears. Appearances are deceiving, I think is what you're getting at, and it's, I've always said that. Mm -hmm. There's much more to a picture than meets the eye, to put it most crudely or simply. And it's true, this, there's a rationality that's quite pleasing to, to this, and, and I recognize that as well, and I recognize what you're saying, that I think a lot of viewers would find comfort in that linearity and that progression. Uh, it's part of my Bauhaus training, you know, when you know, a person of my age at the University of Illinois Chicago, I was taught literally by men that worked with uh, Bucky Fuller and Mahali Naj, really, um, directly, and uh, I went to a technical high school and took drafting, and, uh, two years of it. <laughs> I remember showing work to one of my professors at the University of Illinois, one of the Bauhaus guys named Robert Nickel, a great collage artist. Uh, he said to me, you went to Lane Tech. I said, yes. How did you know? He said, I can see it all over your work. <laughs> and what he was talking about, Jack, was this um, kind of disciplined use of material in a, in a very careful way, and a kind of precision, and the way a sense of design and organization and composition. I think when I got to college, through my uh, own practices in drawing and through the little that I learned in high school art and technology classes that I, I knew what elegance was, I knew what clumsy was. I could be flat-footed or I could be very elegant and I could do it in a controlled manner. And Bob, Nickel, he saw it right away. And I think that that's still part of me. I think you're, you're seeing that. And so, you know, I, I don't want to refute, I can't, I can't refute that. You, it's true, what you recognize in here is true, and I recognize the, the, uh, the pleasing nature of that. But that, that pleasing nature can be deadly, both to myself as a creative person and in terms of what this represents as can, a mentality that's actionable in the world and affects people's it could be horrible. I know that. So what, what, what is it that belies these formalistic maneuvers? You know? And conversely, the, the thing that seems to be entangled and knotted, yeah, I, I can see that as well. But actually, it's very orderly, too. It's just ordered in a nonlinear way. It's not adjacency. It's overlapping. But every component is separable. It's no matter how you kind of cut and dice and splay, but it's that is there. That orderliness is there. Uh, I think if 
we do go ahead and lay out those tissue thin uh, skins of graphic information that are preliminary to the making of these, you'll see the precision that the Light and Tech High School drafting student precision in every individual work, but you'll also see this complex, almost dizzying kind of uh, outcome from their, uh, the interaction of multiple numbers of them. But it, that there, 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 there is, they're still very rationally made. Um, I know that people, as you say, will uh, perhaps not be pleased by how knotted they appear. But um, there's, there's a complexity and an ambiguity that isn't. What is it? Uh, Emson's Seven Types of Ambiguity is a book that Lenore introduced me to and I've been reading casually. And uh, he is from chapter to chapter, from one to seven, precisely describing, giving literary examples of seven kinds of ambiguity. All of which can be artistically productive. And so in terms of deconstructivism, to that every element is a condition of possibility to, to work with any other is what is, well, we'll say, pleasing to me about this print. But on the face of it, I recognize that there'll probably be a number of people that uh, would not uh, favor it in their 